the only two copywriting books that you need to read. So today I'm going to share the two books that are going to get you the most bang for your buck when it comes to copywriting, but these books are not copywriting specific and I'll tell you why and then I'll get into the books and explain exactly how they're going to help you in your copywriting journey. So If you follow me on Instagram or social media, you know that I'm a huge reader. I have a ton of books on copywriting and marketing, but I do have somewhat of a seemingly controversial outlook or or piece of advice or opinion on copywriting books. So one of the most common questions I get is, what copywriting books do I have to read? And I have, I take issue with this question because it, connotates that we have to be reading books before we get into action and start pitching and start our copywriting businesses. I think there comes a time where we have to really stop hiding behind books and doing this endless research and just take action. So while yes, I definitely am obsessed with becoming better and honing my craft, I have to be real and say that when it comes to my copywriting journey, the books that I have read on copywriting would not have made any sense to me if I had read them when I first started out. The only reason I read these books now and the only reason they help me is because I have context, right? I can apply these principles to stuff that I've done with clients and This context is only going to be gained by you working with clients, learning their goals, getting feedback from them, learning what they need. So before you even read another copywriting book, I just want to make it clear that take action before delaying and reading another book because we can get caught in hiding behind these books. You know, my advice is always to just start reaching out to clients with your self-made portfolio pieces and asking for their business, asking them to become a client. You want to just get the inevitable number of no's and rejection that lead to a yes. It is a numbers game and then you can start getting hands-on copywriting experience. Listen, I love reading and learning. I do so much, but putting your knowledge into action is the only thing that is going to actually move the needle so let's talk about the books that i do recommend and why okay so this is the first one the one page marketing plan this book is going to help you as a freelancer because it will give you an overview of your client's marketing plan in the simplest way possible And once you understand what your client is trying to achieve, what your client's goal is, then you can really have this deep understanding of where the copy fits in to help them achieve it. And that's how you level up from just a copywriter to a copywriter that actually understands marketing and can come in as a consultant. What this book helps you do is just understand the big picture. Why am I writing what I'm writing? How am I driving action? How are my words going to impact the customer and the overall business and revenue goals? So let me just tell you how this book is broken out. Some of you are familiar with the term marketing funnel and what a marketing funnel is, is just a visual representation of the customer journey with a company's marketing. What that means is that, you know, what a marketing journey is, is just when a business guides a customer from not knowing that the brand even exists to the point where they say yes and become a customer. That is a customer journey from not knowing anything about you to actually paying, saying yes and becoming a customer. And he breaks the marketing funnel down into three phases. And if you Google what a marketing funnel is, you'll see images and they'll all kind of have different components and they all might look a little bit more detailed or nuanced. So what Alan Dibb does in this book is that he breaks the funnel down into a very simple, you know, three phases of this marketing funnel, which are before, during, and after. So the before phase is when a business does the work to identify who their target audience is and then creates a buyer persona based on that research and that identification. So what does that mean for you? (laughs) As a writer, you need to know 
who you're writing for, for the copy to be effective. That is like the number one rule of copywriting is nothing matters, nothing is good, nothing can be judged unless you know who you're writing for and tailoring your message to them. That's the only way they're going to care about what your message is. This is the phase where a company decides what message they're going to use to grab the attention of their target audience, of that buyer persona. So Alan Dibb, the author, he talks about ways that you can get in the mind of the target customer and create something called a unique selling proposition. And your unique selling proposition is really why any business exists in the first place and why a customer should buy from them instead of the competition, right? Because just to give you a real life example, that you can probably get coffee at any store at every corner, but there's a reason some of us go to Starbucks and get the $5 overpriced coffee, right? So there's something unique that Starbucks is achieving and offering. There's a unique way that they're marketed that really grabs a certain type of person. So during, so, okay, so that's the before phase. You're really just understanding who the target audience is and tailoring, tailoring your message to reach that audience. And as a copywriter, this is really important for you to know because you might be the one doing the research and saying, hey, people in this industry say words like this, they go places like this, they understand terms like this, and that will all be used in your writing. So then there's the during phase. So now that's the center of the marketing funnel. The during phase is when a company has successfully grabbed the attention of that customer, right? So that means your message was effective. And now the goal is to nurture that relationship with even more marketing messages that will continue to build trust and get this customer to like you, the brand, enough to buy, right? That's that no like and trust factor. So how this comes into play is email marketing and newsletters and capturing emails, right? So if somebody clicks on something, it's because a headline or a visual ad has gotten their attention and they are interested enough, their interest has been piqued to the point where they're willing to you know, give you their email address and you can start targeting them or sending them these emails. Why do companies do this? Why, when you go onto a website, there's an instant pop-up that says, hey, do you want 15% off? Enter your email here. They want to not only grab your attention in that moment, right? That's the before phase. Now they want to enter the during phase with you as a customer where they get to continually message you so that you become familiar and that you eventually trust them enough to buy. Sorry, I wanted to make sure my camera was clean. <laughs> so in this phase of the book, the author talks, Alan Dibb, the author explains the importance of capturing potential customers into a database um, so that you can continue to follow up with them. That's something that is a priority for all companies. It will be a priority for your clients is, hey, we want to collect email addresses. We want to build this email list and we want to, we want you to be the one that writes the emails to them. So as a writer, you need to have that goal in mind. Because you're going to be the one that, you know, is creating the content to capture your their attention. Then you might be writing these follow-up messages that continue to nurture the customer. And typically that occurs through emails, blog posts, guides, whatever type of content that's free. And as you can, you know, tell, there there's this funnel happening where it's like everybody at the top then it goes, it whittles down, it whittles down, whittles down to how many people are actually going to buy at the bottom of the funnel, right? So at the during phase, you're at the center of the funnel, the middle of the funnel. The key here, guys, is that most people, especially when we're talking about online buying, which is most of us are going to be digital copywriters, 
People don't buy after just seeing an ad one time. Most customers, most people need to continue to see marketing messages for months or even years before finally becoming a customer. And that's why there is such a big market for us as copywriters, as people who can create, you know, continually create these messages for brands to target their customers with. Now, there's an after phase of the funnel, and I would say that's probably something that I'm not going to go too deep into because it really depends on the industry and the niche that you're in, but the after phase is when a company continues to communicate with somebody post-purchase to increase the likelihood that they'll either remain a customer or that they'll buy again. And just so you, you know, know this, this is a principle with any company and if you say this to your clients, they'll be like, "Okay, yes, like this person understands business." It is always more expensive to acquire a new customer than it is to keep an existing customer. A lot of software and tech companies, they have this very specific measurement and in marketing in general, it's a measurement called um, CAC, Customer Acquisition Cost. So it's always going to cost a company more marketing dollars to grab that initial attention and convert a customer, convert a prospect into a customer. It's always gonna cost them more money to do that. That process is more expensive than it is to target somebody who's already bought something from you because they have already agreed once, they're more likely to agree again. And that actually brings me to the second book that I am going to recommend. So that was the one page marketing plan by Alan Dibb. Sorry if it's backwards because I'm looking into a camera. But this book, Influence by uh, Robert Cialdini huge 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 this book is so important and like i said before with alan dibb he said or or, sorry with business in general he you know we're we're talking about how people are just more likely to do something when they've done it once well all of those concepts are explained in this book persuasion oh i'm sorry it's called influence the psychology of persuasion so This book is really a classic. It is a bestseller. There's 3 million copies sold, translated into 30 different languages for a very specific reason. These are the proven science-backed principles of how to persuade and the psychological principles about what actually gets people to say yes. So copywriting, sales, marketing, they all really have this one goal in common. They aim to persuade someone to say yes and take an action. So while this is, again, not a copywriting specific book, you are going to be using these sales, persuasion, and psychology principles in your writing and that's why it's so important to understand these things as a copywriter i'm going to go into three rules of persuasion there's i believe seven rules that he covers in this book but i'll go into three of the ones that i come across very often in the marketing copywriting world so number one is the rule of reciprocity most people feel compelled to repay someone if they've done if they've been done a favor. You know, you can argue this and say no, I I don't want I don't care about paying people back if they give me something for free, but as a general rule, when somebody does something nice for us, it's kind of a reflex. It's an underlying psychological drive that we want to do something in return. That's why a lot of the times if you smile at someone, you're just it's someone's instant reflex to just give a smile back, right? Real life example of this, this is why as a female, if you are at a bar and a guy comes up to you and offers to buy you a drink, whether you say yes or no to that drink, you have to, as women, we're, we're strategic because if we know that if we accept that drink, 
that man is going to want to talk to us for the rest of the night because we know he's not just buying us a drink because we're thirsty or because he wants us to enjoy ourselves. Man buys you a drink because he wants to talk to you and and he knows because humans know that when somebody does something for us, buys something for us, you know, does a generous gesture, the woman will feel obligated to return the favor in some way and the most classic example of this in marketing and business like the the most all-time biggest example is just the notion of the free sample right why do you think companies give free samples is that because they're in a generous mood no right On the one hand, you could argue that it's because we want people to try our product and gauge whether or not they like it, but it also touches on this deep psychological desire or 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 drive to reciprocate a generous act. And that's why when you're in the mall or you're in the grocery store, it does if you really pay attention to how you're feeling if you really think back it feels awkward when you take a sample from the grocery store lady and she's sitting there smiling with the little piece of chicken on the toothpick and you're like all right peace like a lot of times like i'll pretend that i'm interested (laughs) in the product i'm reading the label like i have no intention of buying this product but i didn't want to be that person that just walks up takes it and dips out And that's why those little um, vestibules in the mall are so effective. I mean, these people are calling out to you, come on, come try this hand lotion. And then you feel slightly guilty when you walk away with no intention to buy, right? So right there, that's the rule of reciprocation, the rule of reciprocity. Okay, number two is which this is endlessly fascinating, especially with today, because the media has such a stranglehold on people and their opinions, and we're so divided as a country in the US, but there is a rule of commitment and consistency. And this principle says that people will do as much as possible so that they appear consistent in their words and actions. That's why uh, a lot of people, if they have a weight loss goal or some type of goal, they're more you know, compelled to state it publicly because once you put it out there and other people know about it, you are compelled to stay consistent with the commitment that you made. Actually, so many fitness influencers that I follow talk about how they created their Instagram account because they just wanted people to feel accountable to and they needed something where if they showed up publicly, they would continue to do the workouts. So once you have committed to something, even in a small way, human nature compels us to keep going with that, to keep our end of the bargain or the deal because we want to appear consistent. That's why people don't like to back out of deals and commitments that they made. That's why there's that guilt there. So what is important here is that we're more likely to do something after we've agreed to it, whether it's verbally, whether it's in writing. So in copywriting, and actually this is written also in the Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy, because the psychology of persuasion, this book Influence, isn't necessarily about copywriting, but if you read the Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy, he is all about copywriting and how to use these psychological principles in the copywriting itself. But basically, in copywriting, when you are writing a sales letter, an email, a landing page, anything that is meant to get the customer to say yes to something, Copywriters use a tactic where they start the letter with statements that the reader is almost 100% likely to agree with. You want to start any piece of copy with very, I guess, obvious statements that it's pretty much impossible to say no to. And that could be something as simple as the date. Like, hey, it's it's Thursday, uh, December 30th. And psychologically, we, we register we say yes in our head. And that's why we might say statements like, you know, if you're targeting weight loss or fitness, wouldn't you like to have more energy and feel more confident in this dress? I mean, majority of people 
are not going to say no to more energy and confidence. So when you start out with these affirmative statements with the goal of getting agreement, you're getting the the reader to nod their head yes. And the more you can get them nodding their head yes and agreeing with your statements, well, as the, the piece goes on, as the copywriting continues, they're just more likely to stay consistent with those head nods and say, yeah, 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 mm-hmm, yeah, I agree with that, right? You want them to stay in agreement throughout the piece because then they're just more likely to take a desired action at the end. And this is clearly a very, this is very oversimplified, but it, you really got to think about that when you're writing. Now, the third one that I'm going to share and the final one is the principle of social proof. So this principle says that the greater the number of people who find any idea correct, well, the higher likelihood that that idea actually is right. So we as people look to the actions of others to decide what appropriate behavior is for ourselves, especially when those people who are deciding what's right, they look like us and we can relate to them. So the simple, the simplest example of this is testimonials and reviews. So on Amazon, we're looking for the products with the best ratings, the, you know, the highest ratings. And why is that? I mean, I have no idea whether these people have the same quality tastes as me, whether these people like what I like. I have no idea who these people are, but when I see that it's been rated 44,000 times with a four and a half out of five star ratings, when I see that many people have agreed that they liked it, now I'm pretty sure that it's a good product. And this is just something psychologically as humans where, where these herd or these pack animals in our origin and we just look to others to make our decisions and it happens on a very deep level because again there's going to be people out there who's like nope i do everything just because i want to do it right okay great there's people who say advertising doesn't work on them how's that working for you <laughs> it works it, it works at a deep deep level you're just not aware of it in marketing that's why testimonials and case studies are so so compelling companies are paying a ton of money to invest in writers who will write case studies. This is just, you know, customers talking about their good experience with a company and how the product helped them. And that's really compelling to prospective customers. So <clears throat> in my niche, which is tech, every technology site will have logos of the notable brands that are using their products. They'll have Google, they'll have Salesforce, because they say, hey, these companies have trusted us. These companies like our product. They like us enough to use our service. And that means you will too. And even as writers, that's why we strive to get these client testimonials, right? We want other writers who are looking at our site to say yes to us. One more, I'm just going to include one more, right? It's the rule of scarcity. So the opportunities that are, the, the opportunities that seem the most valuable to us as people is when their availability is limited. That's why in dating, people will say, well, you should play hard to get, right? That's where this notion come, comes from. That's why on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, why do you think we behave in this way? And I'm a big cyber monday person i don't like black friday because i hate crowds but cyber monday i'm like oh yeah what what deals can i get and why we're compelled to do that is because we are convinced that these deals are limited by time i know if i get it on a tuesday i will have lost out on the deal so on a deep level, we know that the things that are difficult to possess are typically better than those that are easy to get, right? So we can use an item's availability to help us quickly and correctly decide on its quality. And rather than weighing all the pros and cons, which would take so much brain energy, we kind of use scarcity as this mental shortcut that helps us make the decision. And one of the best examples in my life, so every time, so I'm not a big brand person when it comes to brand clothing and shoes, but I, I am into purses. I'll tell you that. I like expensive 
purses and I like purses that are classic things that are not going to go out of style so when I got my recent like big payout one of the things I like to do (laughs) is buy myself one of these brand name purses that are so ridiculously expensive but it's my thing so whatever everyone needs their one thing and guys have their cars and some girls love shoes i love purses so i wanted to buy the a classic chanel wallet on a chain it's a ridiculous amount of money for something that's not even a full purse it barely fits my cell phone but whatever i wanted this bag And when I went to go purchase this bag, I called Chanel and there's only really one where I live, one Chanel store. The only alternative is to go into Manhattan, which I was not willing to do. So I call this store and I'm like, hey, I clearly can't buy this online. How do I like place an order with you guys? These people are like, oh, um, to buy a Chanel bag, you either have to come in person and speak to an advisor or you need to have bought from us in the past. Have you ever bought from us? I'm like, no. I'm like, listen, I live an hour away. just want to buy the purse. She's like, well, listen, you got to come in in person. And actually, there's no guarantee. There's actually a wait list for this bag. I'm like, there's a wait list for a bag for a purse? She's like, yeah, this is the... She's like, because you want this classic one, they're in really high demand. And we only get shipments intermittently. So I have no idea when it's going to come in. But you can come in and put your name on the list. And maybe we'll call you and get it. And my dumbass ran right, (laughs) drove an hour to this store and an hour back to get on the damn waiting list. And then once they finally called me, I went back an hour. And so I just said to myself the whole time, this is the exact rule of scarcity. This, I said, I, I see it playing out. I'm falling for it. I'm a victim of this. They are making it seem so hard for me to get this purse. And I'm falling for it hook line and sinker and maybe you guys know this with products that you wanted to buy i heard that tesla's like you can't get one right now because they're the supply chain issues or whatever maybe they just made that up so again guys influence and the one page marketing plan check out these books (laughs) because they speak to the broader big picture Once you get clients, hit up the Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy, the Ad Week Copywriting Handbook. I have all of that in highlights on my Instagram story. They're good books, but you definitely want to first have a broader understanding of your client's goals and B, you want to also not get too obsessed with learning copywriting. You want to get out and pitch clients and start doing some blog writing, get your foot in the door, and then you can hone your craft as you go. I hope this is helpful. Good luck, and I'll talk to you next week.